The Girl with the Saddest Secret is a foster care memoir from Angela Hart. This was originally released in 2020, which is roughly the time I would have read it for the first time. And I've just finished rereading it. And I have to say it is one that I recommend, although there are two frustrating things about it. Not necessarily in terms of how it's written, but with the information that's provided. And I'll discuss those points with a spoiler warning in a little bit. But for now, this will be spoiler free. And I do recommend it, so I don't want to spoil anything in too much detail. But this is about a, a young girl called Jasmine. I believe she's eight years old. And it starts out as a respite placement that ends up being, of course somebody that Angela and Jonathan look after more full-time and I have to say Jasmine is generally not a likable person it's not her fault she's got a, a tragic past as often they do but it was difficult at times to find any redeeming qualities about her sometimes with foster care memoirs a child can have really bad behavior but then they can do things or say things that make you see the goodness with Jasmine I didn't find that that was the case for the most part but at no point did I ever think that it was her fault. And I feel like it was very clear that she suffered some kind of trauma in her earlier childhood. But what that trauma is, is also unclear. And I will say one of the things I don't love about this is that we don't get that many answers. I'll talk more about that with a spoiler warning in a moment. But it was quite frustrating that we kind of start getting led down the path of what could be the case. And as soon as we seem like we're getting answers... We don't get anywhere. And again, I'll discuss that with a spoiler warning in a moment, but that's worth bearing in mind that I was left with more questions than I did have answers. Of course, this is largely about Jasmine's behavior and trying to work out, first of all, how best to handle that behavior, such as rewarding good behavior rather than punishing bad behavior, the problems Jasmine has at school and whether or not she can be at mainstream school, at least until she's statented, and also what it's like living with Jasmine for the other little girl, Erica, who Angela and Jonathan are fostering. If I remember rightly, Erica was a year older than Jasmine, but they are very close in age. Sometimes got on really well, sometimes didn't. And it also begs the question, why didn't social services do more to find Jasmine a, a single placement? Because some children do well on their own with foster carers. Other children are perfectly fine to be around other children. And I think it was a real disservice to Erica. Because Jasmine basically, not always, but often made Erica's life very difficult. And it seems like social services didn't really care about the effect that Jasmine was having on Erica. Not that Angela didn't feed any of this back to social services, because as we see in the book, she does. But social services seemed to not care. And that's pretty awful. And I'm sure they did care deep down, but they didn't seem to do anything to suggest that. It's generally well written. It's got a good pace to it. It you know, it includes a lot of information. It goes into quite a lot of detail. As I said, we don't always get answers for the questions that are being raised, but there is a lot going on. And I think it's very easy to engage with this book and to follow Jasmine's story and to want the best for her. Even though I said it was very difficult to like her as a character, and I say character because these are based on truth, but of course heavily modified to protect the identity of the real children. It was difficult to like her, but I still wanted the best for her. It's not like I didn't care about her. And again, as I said, it was very clear that her behavior is the product uh, of things that had happened to her in her childhood. So I definitely do recommend it. However, there are a few things that made this a little frustrating. And there will be spoilers from now. I won't ultimately spoil what happens at the end with Jasmine's care, where she ends up, or whether it's a long-term placement. But I will go into a bit of detail about a few spoiler things. And the first thing is something I've already touched upon, and that's the fact that there are quite a few questions at the end. And fair enough, if Angela didn't receive the answers to those questions, then we can't receive them. But that doesn't mean it's not a frustrating read. For example, the red door, green door, what was that about? And... Also about her scar, I actually came to a different conclusion about Jasmine's scar. She has a scar on her forehead, and I'd be really keen to know what everybody else read into this. But when she acted out the scene with the doll, Angela kind of thought that it meant that her mother had thrown her down the stairs and then left her. But I read it that she'd started this fire, 
Her mother had walked out because she couldn't cope with Jasmine's behaviour and to punish Jasmine for her mother walking out, her father threw her down the stairs and shouted at her and said those horrible things. That's what I read. And to me, that seemed obvious. But obviously, it couldn't be obvious if Angela had a different interpretation of Jasmine's behaviour. So I'd be very keen to know if anybody else had the same thought that I did. But either way, whether it was her father or her mother, it's still a horrible, horrible thing to have happened. So that was kind of frustrating to not have the answers. The other thing, well, two other things, really. One is that I didn't really believe what happened with her EEG happened the way it did because there were no meetings. You don't just go for a scan, find out that there's a problem and then get a letter through the post and that's it. And nobody talks about it, particularly with a child. And I feel like we were either not given all of the information that happened after the fact or it just didn't happen that way because you wouldn't just get a letter through the post that said, in the midst of all of this you know, chaotic information, if you don't know what you're reading, a little sentence that said, I can't remember exactly what it said, but it was a small sentence that said there was a problem with her frontal lobe. There would be there would be follow-up appointments. At the very least, there would be a follow-up phone call to explain the findings and what it meant and, from a medical perspective, how they might help Jasmine to, to deal with that and how it affects her behaviour. So either that didn't happen or it didn't happen the way it was written in the book. So that was frustrating. I guess the third option there is that that is how it happened and they were deeply let down medically, but I'd like to hope that that's not the case. The other frustrating thing, which again is something I hope didn't happen this way, is the emotional abuse from her social worker. Her social worker emotionally abused her by telling her her abusive father was waiting for her outside the school. That's not acceptable. To tell an adult that their abuser is waiting outside for them is horrible. To say it to a young child who doesn't have any control over their actions, who doesn't have any control over their life, who would instantly think they're about to be taken outside to their abuser, that's emotional abuse. And the fact that it was just brushed off with, oh, the social worker's going through a divorce, let's just sign him off sick instead. No, you fire him. You make sure he can never work with children again. There is no excuse for emotionally abusing an eight-year-old child who is very vulnerable. That is unacceptable. And as I said, I really hope that that's not what happened. Because I think to think that a social worker could emotionally abuse a child like that, bearing in mind he'd also allegedly just threatened her with a children's home, saying that she'd be put into a children's home within 14 days. We never clarified whether he did or that was Jasmine just saying it. But based on the other emotional abuse, it seems very likely. I, I don't want to believe that a social worker can um, emotionally abuse and manipulate an eight-year-old child like that and then not have any repercussions other than getting signed off sick. I don't want that to be the truth because that's horrible. Social services are there to help the children, to support children, to be on their side, to get them the best quality of life they can and to protect them from any dangers. And instead, he's taunting her with these dangers, threatening her. And he's not a nice person. I don't care if he's going through a divorce. There is no excuse for abusing a child emotionally like that. And if it was a foster carer who'd said that, I believe they'd be told, right, you can't foster anymore because we can't have you emotionally abusing children. So either I hope it was completely fabricated for the book and it didn't happen like that, or he wasn't signed off sick and he was actually fired because that's unacceptable. And that is one of the most frustrating things I've ever read. And I hope it's not true. However, the rest of the book, most of the rest of the book is not that frustrating, but it isn't. I got to the end of it and just thought I have too many questions. There are several things in this that I don't want to believe is true. So it's definitely a very different read. But that aside, I still, you know, I liked the process of seeing support for Jasmine, of finding out what measures could help her with her behavior. So there were some interesting things in the book. It's not the easiest read, but at the same time, I would recommend it. I know I've just spoiled several things, so I'm hoping you've read it if you're still listening. But I certainly didn't mind it, and I'm pretty happy to recommend it. <laughs>